Thank you, Oliver, so much for joining us today for our introduction to effective and practical research data management. I'm Christina Magda. I'm the Data Collections Development Manager at UK Data Service. In my day-to-day -day job, I wear two hats. Um, I look after the acquisition of data for the UK Data Service but I also wear a research data management hat to ensure that data are well organized, well documented and well preserved for future reuse. Today, we have quite a bit of content to cover and it is an overview into the research data life cycle, the fair data principles, because we keep hearing a lot about them, but how do we as researchers ensure the fair data principles are applicable to our collections? A little bit about data management planning, very briefly touching on ethical and legal considerations, looking at data curation best practices and talking about formatting, organizing, versioning, and also documenting data, and hopefully demystifying the concept of metadata. We look a little bit at data security, storage, and backup as well, as well as data sharing strategies. At the end of the workshop, we will conclude with a question and answer session um, and all the questions can be put in the Q&A box. Now, without further ado, the learning objectives, um, again, it's about understanding the basic concepts and importance of managing research data effectively throughout its life cycle. So we think of data as constantly living, it, it, it doesn't um, it doesn't end. It's about familiarizing with the key ethical and legal considerations when handling research data. And we do have um, other workshops and I've linked to them in um, this slide so you can go and attend those workshops for much more in-depth information about ethical and legal considerations. Learning the fundamentals of making research data findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. So we're talking about the fair principles. By far following best practices for data curation, storage, and also dissemination. And finally, but just as importantly, understand the appropriate data sharing strategies that respect the ethical and legal considerations we're talking about, but also enable fair data. Now, let's start a quick menti, and I'm going to put in chat the code as well. It's on the, sli on the slide. If you go to menti.com, and use the code 11100-7492. That is going to start the poll, and I'm curious to find out what types of data do you work with? Is it survey data? Is it interview data, admin data, health data, and so on? So if we go to menti.com and we use the code 1100 seven four nine two you can then press join um, you can also scan the qr code if you'd like um, probably easier if you have your phone handy um, just curious what types of data do you work with and we can see we're getting a lot of different answers surveys are the key one currently um, health data interviews um, more people saying interviews observation clinical epidemiological data, all data. Yes, um, mixed methods is becoming more and more common because you can address much, um, much easier questions when you can use all different uh, data, publicly available data, workshop transcripts, genomic sequencing. We can see a variety of data that's being used. This is fantastic. And thank you all so much for completing the poll. He's just gathering some information from you um, and thinking in terms of the future workshops as well. However, we might change the content to fit better with the type of data that our um, participants are using. Now, I do have a second question. Um, what are the first words that come to your mind when you hear research data management? Hopefully, no one is going to say um, headache. They're going to be positive words. Um, but what are the first words that come to your mind when you hear research data management? Databases, yes. Secure, ethic, data, safely. Aha, someone did say headache. 
So with the workshop today, we are trying to make it less of a headache and think how we can practically implement effective research data management and making the process much more straightforward for researchers because it can be time consuming and resource intensive. And this is why organizations such as UK Data Service are here to support researchers and be able to, to provide um, research data management support for them. We have tools, we have templates that you can use, guidance available online um, that you can use and reshare as well. Oh, ethics and GDPR are taking the lead um, and as I've mentioned, we do have a very focused session um, coming later in the spring um, term around um, GDPR ethical and legal concerns as well. This is just to provide a, an overview of the session today, but hopefully just as useful as, a, as an introduction for you all. And now a final one for now. Is there a specific aspect of data management that you are particularly interested in? So are you interested about finding more um, about curation processes, how to file format, how to document your data, how to organize metadata? What even is metadata? Um, do we have to worry on an individual level about metadata structures and schemas and so on? So or is there a specific aspect or are there multiple specific aspects of data management that you are particularly interested in? Ethical and legal, we have seen in the previous ones a lot of um, interest in, in ethical and legal. Voting oh, should be on now. Any specific aspect or aspect, quality and consistency in reporting of data how to advise new PGR students, data pipelines and interoperability, file naming and documentation, metadata, structuring classification, how to organize data files from different sources, how to structure my workflow and best practices for documentation, how to maintain good metadata, documentation and metadata, it's, it's great because we do cover documentation and metadata today, um, and we do have as well a focus session. Um, today, they're the overview principles, but documentation and metadata, as well as all the other considerations when it comes to research data management, they can get complex quite easily. So we decided to create additional um, workshops focused on um, those specific topics, and links are available in the slides. Now, moving on to effective research data management, why do we want to implement effective research data management? Well, this way we ensure that our data are compliant with ethical standards and applicable legislation. And especially with the types of data you were saying that you are working with, some of the data was indeed publicly available. So most likely that is not personal data, but most other data could have potential to be personal data. So we need to be very careful when it comes to the applicable legislation. We know that by having effective research data management in place, we can have well-organized quality control and well-documented data that is safely stored, backed up, processed and analyzed and actually ensures that data is responsibly archived and preserved and appropriately shared for future reuse. At the end of the day, the takeaway message from this um, session today is that RDM practices safeguard the integrity of research. One of the key funders in the UK is the UK Research and Innovation, um, which consists of different research councils in the UK. They understand data as a public good, especially data that's funded from public money, and they insist on making the data available as open as possible and as restricted as necessary. Of course, we have the ethical and legal considerations we bear in mind, and they appreciate that good research data management practices should be followed throughout the project rather than at a specific point in time. This is where the research data lifecycle comes in. 
We're thinking of data in all of the stages from planning. What do we want to collect? Is there data out there that might help our hypothesis that we could maybe combine with the new data that we're collecting and so on? When we collect data, how do we collect it? What tools are we using? What formats are we using? When we're processing and analyzing the data, how do we document it? How do we make sure that the processes and the analysis that we're doing, they're um, following integrity practices? How do we preserve and share data? Again, going back to making sure that we have well-documented data and we have metadata in place and also go going to reuse. It might be that you yourself end up reusing the data after four, five, ten years' time, where we've seen cases where um, researchers ended up using their data after 20 years' time. By ensuring effective research data management, they were able to do that. And of course, by ensuring that the data is made available for future reuse. Now, we're very lucky since 2016 onwards because um, scientific data published the FAIR data principles. And it's to make the research data management much easier to understand, but also much more uh, machine actionable as well. The FAIR principle refer to findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable data. Now, if we look at each um, principle, findable, and we can see meta is in brackets and followed by data because it's metadata and data that have to have assigned a unique identifier. Data must be described with, with, with rich metadata. Metadata must clearly and explicitly include an identifier and metadata and data must be registered and indexed in a searchable resource. Accessible, again, metadata and data are retrievable via their identifier using a standardized communications protocol. And again, the FAIR principles are not here to scare you, and we're going to go over what you can do as a researcher to ensure that your data is FAIR. Most likely, it's not going to be setting up a standardized communication protocol. Um, you can. Um, but it's probably too resource consuming and there are already available tools out there that you can use in responsible repositories. It's important for the communication protocol to be open, free and universally implementable. And of course, to allow for authentication and authorization where necessary. And here we're talking about different access levels that might be applicable to data. Metadata must be accessible even when the data are no longer available. Of course, the advice is data should be available in perpetuity, but we know research is challenging. Sometimes data might have to be withdrawn either for ethical or legal constraints, while metadata should still be made available to describe what data was created. And it still enhances networking and collaboration because other researchers could get in touch with you to find out more about your research and you could start a project together. Interoperability. Again, we're talking about metadata and data together. They need to use a formal, accessible, shared and broadly applicable language for knowledge representation. Use standard vocabularies that follow the FAIR principles. And again, both of them must include qualified references to other metadata and data as well. We're talking about related resources. So when we have, for example, different reports that we publish or whether we do a follow-up survey, ensuring that all of them are interlinked. Reusable. Again, metadata and data must be richly described. They must be released with a clear and access accessible data access license. They must have proper provenance in place that other researchers have access to, and they must meet domain relevant community standards. Again, you as a researcher will not have to start um, creating domain responsible um, metadata standards, because this is where responsible repositories come into place. So from a researcher perspective, how to ensure fair data your first point of call is using a responsible repository. Not only that they provide, for example, the communication protocols, the metadata schemas that must be used, but they can actually help you throughout the research data management lifecycle to prepare the data and the documentation that you have to share.
There are responsibilities at the researcher's end. As a researcher, you do have to create rich metadata and documentation for your collection. You need to be clear on your access procedures, and of course, these are dependent on the protocols you have been using. You standardize vocabularies, ontologies, and schemas, and today we're briefly covering a little bit about standardized um, vocabularies that you can use in your data to allow interoperability, and also adopting open and standard formats for both data and metadata. Especially for data, we will be looking at how to actually choose the format that's most useful to you. And we do provide recommended formats for social sciences, and a link is included in the slides. Now, why would researchers do all of this? because there's so many success stories. Um, from the UK data service perspective, on a daily basis, we see secondary data being used for policy changing research. We've seen understanding society data being used to, to see how a greater satisfaction with life can be achieved by engaging with arts, culture, and sports. Um, the English longitudinal study of aging, how enjoying later life can be linked to living longer. Um, all of us want to live longer, um, potentially. The Millennium Cohort Study investigating the conditions associated with parental involvement with children, or the Family Resource Survey used to analyze migrants' experiences of poverty and compare them with the experiences of UK born people. I hope that gives you um, a bit more oomph um, to, to create um, fair data and to share your data um, because you don't know how policy changing effects um, it might have when it's used by secondary researchers. And of course, my ethical and legal compliance hat on, you must ensure that you can share that data. Now, we're going to be looking a little bit into data management plans. So what are these data management plans? Instead of taking uh, the example from a specific funder from UKRI, we do have on our web pages guidance for the ESRC data management plan. We're taking a look from a generalized perspective because even if your research is not funded, um, we do actually advise researchers to think of preparing a data management plan. That should contain your data description. And again, we're talking about the data you're creating, but also existing data, whether you're using existing data. Ethical and legal considerations and compliance. Again, are you working with personal data? Does personal data legislation apply? What are the ethical considerations when it comes to the data that you're using? Are you using social media data, making it very complex from the ethical perspective and so on? Curation of data makes you think about how am I going to organize my files, format them, document them, and make sure that I can make this data available um, for future research or that I will be able to use it in a couple of years' time data security, storage, and backup, and we're looking at strategies to make sure that all of these are in place and we are not going to lose our data. Data sharing strategies, how are you going to share this data? Of course, the data sharing strategies, well, in today's world, there, there's multiple data sharing strategies, um, and it's trying to pick the one that fits most with the data that you are um, doing. And yes, there are possibilities, even if you use secondary data, on how to share um, code rather than the data as well. And finally, a data management plan should also include a section around responsibilities and resources. Because this way we can ensure that we plan in time, we know what type of resource we need, we know who's going to be responsible, for example, for quality assessing the data or for preparing the documentation for the data, because there might be different people. And we can also think how all of these um, different responsibilities are actually interconnected and how we can ensure um, that the project team is working together. Now, why is data management planning essential? It really helps us anticipate and prepare because you have to think from the start, what data am I using? Is there available data? 
if there is available data under what access the data is available, how long might I need to access the data? If I need to create the data, how much data can I actually feasibly create within the project time that I have? We have seen a lot of projects nowadays, they're quite short, 12 to 18 months. So it brings that realistic side as well. And it can be used, of course, for dissertation. So again, we're not just talking about funded research. Keeping on track. Once you have a data management plan in place, it doesn't stop. You have to update it. Research evolves and the same for the data management plan. But having the schema, the, the very beginning and updating it throughout ensures that, for example, if people leave the research team, um, we know it can happen. You know exactly what resource needs to be complemented um, and makes you able um, to, to prepare in time to be able to cover specific aspects. It actually ensures that you have the necessary resources because the necessary resources might not just be from your project team. They might include institutional resources as well. So for example, when we're talking about storage, which is the following one, you might actually need resources from your institutional organizational IT team to be able to store that data properly. Sharing fair data and ensuring reproducibility, because when we do a data management plan, we are thinking in advance and we make sure that we do organize, document, format, and so on to enable data sharing at the end of the project. And of course, meet funders' expectations as well. More and more funders are expecting data sharing, more and more funders are expecting a data management plan. Yes, in the current new funding service, um, some um, funders, UKRI funders, are currently just using a data sharing management question. It's a very short one of 500 words. Um, we still advise researchers, if the project proposal was successful and you have gained that funding, to prepare a full data management plan because it is going to help um, throughout your research. Now, the best tool researchers can make use of when it comes to data management planning, if you're unaware, is DMP Online. It's a web-based platform that was created by the Digital Curation Center, um, and it helps researchers not only create data management plans, but create them based on the organization that's providing the funding. Not to worry, if you do not have um, funding, you can create a standard data curation center data management plan, which covers the sections we were talking about earlier. Also review, and if you would like, you can share your data management plans as well. If you have never done a data management plan, DMP Online also offers publicly available data DMPs. So you can have a look over them and see what others might have included, for example, when talking about the description of data, how did they describe the data, what level of granularity have they included in that section. Now, another main tip for you, just making sure that um, voting is open, opening voting. What do you think is the most important component of a data management plan? I'll keep a chat, uh, an eye on chat to make sure that the voting is working. Okay, so we have a, a couple of votes for data security storage and backup. Quite a few votes on all are equally important. Yes, all are equally important because we think of data in the research data lifecycle. By all means, data security, backup, storage, they're all important, data minimization, anonymization, and so on. But for the research data lifecycle, all the components of a data management plan are just as important, making sure that we understand the ethical and legal considerations for our own data 
making sure that we curate the data and we have the metadata in documentation to make available. Thank you all for answering the poll. Oh, we just refreshed. Look at it, 26. Yes, all are equally important. Now, moving forward, um, ethical and legal considerations overview. So very briefly, we're looking at, say we are collecting new data, um, or even when using um, secondary data. Now, when using secondary data, it depends where we use that data from. If we use that data from a responsible repository, we can trust that ethical considerations have already been properly assessed by the repository and we can use that data without creating any issues. When it comes to um, primary um, data, we have additional considerations and we need to think carefully about them. In a nutshell, we're talking about maximizing benefits for the society and for the individual and minimizing risks. So ensuring, for example, we do not collect data that we should not be collecting. We ensure safe storage of data. We ensure safe sharing of data and so on. We need to ensure that participation is voluntary as much as possible. Yes, there is recognition that with some certain research, voluntary participation might not be possible. And I cannot stress enough, if that is the case, do get in touch with your um, ethical boards as soon as possible. Please get in touch with us as well, um, and we can help um, as much as we can. And also informed consent. And a key consideration here, we are talking about the ethical considerations. We are not confusing the informed consent with the consent as a legal basis for processing personal data. No, but informed consent, as in letting researcher, uh, per research participants know the study's purpose, how their data will be used, are there any risks in the data, it's very important to allow them to understand exactly what the research is about. Of course, respecting the individual rights and dignity, and again, we're going back to making sure, are we collecting too much data? How do I anonymize, pseudonymize the data accordingly? How do I delete the data? What is the retention schedule? Ensuring integrity and transparency, having a privacy notice for your research participants, having proper participant information sheet and consent forms in place, but also having clear responsibilities in ensuring independence of the, of the research project. So it's very important to let participants know how they can raise queries they might have with the research and also always, if there is a conflict of interest that cannot be avoided, to ensure that that is actually defined. Now, when it comes to legal considerations, and most of the data that we've seen in the examples, we, we might be talking about personal data as well, or anonymized data. If we're talking about personal data, we need to ensure that we know the data legislation that applies. So for example, in the UK, the main legislation that apply are the Data Protection Act from 2018 and the UK GDPR. Now, under these legislations, we must, for example, identify a lawful basis for processing data. And by processing data, it means collecting, analyzing it, anonymizing absolutely all the processes that you are doing on the data. In the UK, we're actually quite lucky um, because most research, especially research done from um, universities, is conducted under public task. Um, in Europe, for example, in Germany, they actually use consent, um, which is much more difficult to deal when it comes to, to the rights of the participants. Um, you can still book places on our workshops into um, legal considerations and also the introduction to anonymization techniques. Um, they go much more in depth um, and we do talk about data minimization, how do we ensure data minimization and how do we anonymize data. Um, from a legal consideration as well, we need to ensure the secure storage of data and there's considerations out there, could I put the data in the cloud and how do I ensure that actually I can put that data in the cloud, again, when we're talking about personal data data retention and disposal. Especially for funded research, organizations will have data retention policies. 
So it's very important to consult institutional policies around the data retention because it does differ from one type of data, one type of document to another even. Data sharing protocols. How are you going to share your data? Have you made sure that the data can be shared from a legal perspective? And here, again, in the UK, we can leverage legislation. We have the Digital Economy Act that's that allows public authorities to share the identified data with um, researchers that are accredited under the Digital Economy Act. So that is one thing that we can actually take advantage of in the UK. Of course, when it comes to legal considerations, we must not forget about fairness, transparency and accountability as well. And lastly, intellectual property rights. And we do have just as important intellectual property rights. It sounded like that's, a, that's the least of our concerns. It is not. It is a huge concern and researchers should understand whether they have copyright in their work, is it institutional copyright, is it the project team, and so on. And we do have specific workshops that go in detail about copyright considerations. And you can still book places onto that. Now, how do ethical and legal considerations in data management, from your point of view, affect the integrity and impact of research? Now, making sure it is open this time, um, Zoom, probably not Zoom, but PowerPoint doing bizarre things and closing polls at time. So how do ethical and legal considerations in data management affect the integrity and impact of research data? A more difficult question, though. I'm I'm giving it a couple more minutes, and it is a it is a short answer. Um, Lack of appropriate planning might prevent sharing or replicability. Exactly. Let me just close this. Potential for less data gathered raises the integrity, but can sometimes reduce impact as some info may be left out. Yes, when we're talking about um, sharing of personal data, um, I can see where um, that is coming from. But again, in the UK, because we use um, mostly public tasks for research data, there is that consideration around leveraging the Digital Economy Act for sharing much more data that could be shared otherwise. We would just be talking about anonymized data. Um, could invalidate your research? Yes. Um, and there have been plenty of allegation into research misconduct that have been demonstrated. Um, potential for less data to be openly shared, um, exactly, if we don't ensure that. Um, and we've seen it here. It's less and less happening. Um, so it, it's getting much better over time. But we have seen protocols that preclude data sharing because of specific wording. For example, no data will be seen by anyone outside of the team. Um, luckily, retrospective consent does work in those scenarios, um, in most of them. Um, so that's one way to, to, to make, make up. Making data set shareables with DOI, so peer review is possible, exactly. Word even consent will limit secondary reuse. Lack of confidentiality of sensitive data can discourage future participation, exactly. And especially with all the data breaches, and they're usually from commercial companies, but with the data breaches, people are um, more risk averse um, because they do not want their data leaked. Now, in a nutshell, um, thank you all so much for completing the 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 Menti, the difficult question in Menti. This was not a, an easy one like the previous ones. It is about protecting participants, maintaining and building trust as well, or better said, further building trust, enable sharing of data and collaboration, ensuring long-term impact. Um, we have researchers, for example, they conducted their studies in their 60s or 70s. Um, they shared their data and their data is currently used by other projects. So that shows how, how long-term impact can be. And of course, enable appropriate risk management because risk needs to be managed appropriately. Uh, we don't need to put in place specific criteria if they are not needed. 
Now, moving on to data curation, we're looking firstly at formatting and organizing. So when we talk about file format, it's always best to have a strategy. And when I'm saying a strategy, try to answer these questions. What format is best suited for data creation? This will be dependent on the platform you're using as well. Is that format suited for data analysis and any other plan used for the data? Now, from only these two questions, we can have different file formats. It's just making sure that we have the correct file format for what we're trying to achieve. What format is best suited for long-term sustainability and sharing of data? Should I use an open or a proprietary format? Should it be lossy or not? And for example, the, the lossy um, easiest um, example is for JPEG. JPEG actually loses some information compared to TIFF. Um, which one should you be using? Do you need to save the space? Is the information that you're losing not necessary? And also, is the format suitable for conversion? Because it might be, and we've seen this in a, in a number of research projects, researchers might have used the data in um, CSV or TSV because they've used R, um, but a lot of our researchers that use the data available with UK Data Service still use software such as SPSS and Stata, the proprietary ones. So we still make available Stata and SPSS um, to enable further research. In terms of recommended file formats, hopefully this makes it much easier for choosing one because we do have a table with all the recommended file formats depending on the types of the data. On the slide, I've only provided for quantitative tabular data with extensive metadata. Yes, proprietary formats are fine, SPSC, SPSS, Stata, SAS. You could also have the command to set up files, or for quantitative tabular data with minimal metadata, we're talking about CSV, tab delimited, all the open formats. And again, you can have the data in multiple formats. What's important then is version control. So when we're talking about version control, we need to think what versions do we actually need to keep? Do we need to keep all the versions? Or for example, can I have version 1.1 one, one, once I have version 2 already deleted because I only need version 1, version 2, the main, um, the main versions? It's important to uniquely identify these different versions and to make sure that they're in the file name and also record changes. Um, you can have a specific um, part of the document that records changes, or you could use, for example, tools like Word that track changes across documents. Ensure that you record the relationship between the different items that you might have. So sometimes we might have um, base like questionnaire data kept in one database and then have health related data kept in another database. Ensure that you have documentation that clearly marks the relationship between the files. Ensure that you know where the files are and whenever possible, just have a single location for these master files and the milestone files that you are keeping. If you are unable to identify a single location, always synchronize the files. Um, it becomes much more difficult when you have um, multiple um, locations. Now, when it comes to file naming strategy, um, it's really important to have the version, the date, the initials of the creators when possible. Here I'm talking when we are working with our data, we change it once we share that data. Um, actually briefly describe the content of, of the data file or documentation file, having a publication date where applicable in a project number where applicable as well. When it comes to best practices, um, it is about creating meaningful names, but also brief names. We do not want names that are 200 characters long. Using file names to classify the types of files, so having survey, transcript, user guide, data list, clearly describing what that data is. 
using dates in a standardized format. Now, our preferred format is year, month, day. Other preferred formats can be used as well, but just ensuring that it's actually kept the same throughout all the files rather than keep changing month for day and day for month and year, putting it at the front and then at the back and so on. Trying to avoid capitalization or camel case where possible. Um, this is specifically a problem for Unix-based systems. Um, and the same for spaces, dots, and special characters. If you use a Unix platform and you have a space, um, it comes up with 20% afterwards. It, it doesn't look quite nice. That's why we always advise to use either hyphens or underscores to separate elements in a data file rather than um, spaces. Always reserve the file extension for the file extension. So what I'm meaning by that is in the data file name, do not include, for example, docx documentation 2024 dot dot um, docx. Um, it becomes very confusing. Try to avoid at all costs, including extensions in the file name. Include versioning within file names where appropriate. I'm saying where appropriate because it is talking about how do we name the files once we archive them. Once we've archived the files, and that's the basically final version for sharing, you don't have to include that version 12 or 13 or 20, depending on how many changes you had to make. Now, based on that quick overview, which is an advisable file name example? We do have open voting. And we have three examples in there. We have data 0 to 7 2023, we're using underscores. Interview transcript participant 27 CM version 3. And interview 027 underscore CM underscore V3. That is the one winning 2024 um, April, 1st of April. The one leading is the correct one uh, because the more information, it needs to be brief, but the more information we can provide, the better. So in here, we're giving a couple of examples. The first one, we know project number 6614 is wave two of the UK household, like, um, household longitudinal study SPSS data 10th edition last edited on 15th of April 2024. If I would have as on the main data 2023, which data is it? I'm not going to be able to remember that. And what version of the data is it? Did I edit it? When did I last edit it? And it's the same for transcript data, and it's the same for documentation as well. So for example, Scottish Health Survey 2021 data set, documentation second version. It's very important to keep this file naming. It just makes life so much easier. And it does become second nature. At the beginning, it can be quite a lot, I would say, um, because, oh, I need to put the date and I forgot to put underscores. But as you do it more and more, it just becomes second nature. So it's very easy to handle. Now, today we are talking about an overview and it's just the, the, the brief context, but I could not include a little bit about variable formatting and measurements levels. Why? Because this is something that can easily go wrong um, and can have, well, quite a lot of disadvantages when it comes to data usability. So a very simple but important step is to check whether the data are to be treated as string or numeric, especially when we're converting from one type of format to another type of format. Additionally, for numerical variables, do we ensure that the measurement level is correctly defined? Now, this is giving just a, a short example, data uses categorical and continuous for numerical variables as um, 
measurement, SPSS uses nominal, ordinal, and scale. Depending on the type of data you're using is very important if you're working with quantitative data to ensure that the measurements are correct, especially when you're doing analysis on the data or you're preparing that data for sharing for further analysis because it can skew results um, and it can, it can really affect data usability. Folder structure. Again, very similar with the file names. Um, initially, is why do I have to create all of these folders? Um, it doesn't take a lot of time, realistically. We can see in the example, we have NB1. Oh, project, we have a data folder and a documentation folder, and under those folder, we have nicely labeled um, subfolders. Under data, we have databases, and databases have consumer survey, stakeholder network analysis, and stakeholder survey images from focus groups and landscape images. Again, this becomes second nature. Um, well, while I was a student, I didn't used to do this at all. Um, I started working at the archive and I use folder structure for personal um, things as well. That is how my um, laptop is organized. And it, it does make finding things much more easier, um, especially if you forget the file name um, that, you, that you're searching for. Now, when it comes to quality assurance, and at the very end of the slide, we do have tools that you can use. If we're talking about numeric data, quality assurance can be, um, I wouldn't say necessarily semi-automated um, because you still have to run the checks, but you do have a tool that helps you to assess whether the, the quality assurance of the data is okay, and that is QA My Data. Um, and I urge everyone that's working with numerical data to try to give QA My Data uh, a go. It has an in-depth guide um, and it provides information of whether the IDs are duplicates, do you have variable and value labels without actually having to manually um, eyeball and check the entire data. Because when it comes to quality assurance, it is double checking that the observation and responses are fine as per the questionnaire. Is the data complete? especially when we convert from one format to another one, making sure that that data is complete is very, very important. There are specific tools, for example, stat transfer that allow this conversion um, and it, it does it properly. But when we convert using less known tools, it can happen that it only converts half of the data or three quarters of the data and so on. Ensuring that we have variable and value labels as appropriately, ensuring that frequencies mean ranges, they, they look fine. Um, and I guess with the quality assurance, we can look a little bit into the disclosure risk assessment as well, because when we're talking about outliers, those might be a problem, most likely from a disclosure perspective as well. So that risk of re-identification of re-identifying participants. Of course, for qualitative data, it's very important to check whether transcriptions ever have been made, really easy to make them. So having a double check for any errors that came during the transcription process is really important. Now, I did say we're demystifying metadata and documentation. When we think about metadata, the easiest way to understand it, or so I found, um, you're going to let me know in the feedback, um, is to think of metadata as data plus metadata equals information. If you just have data, yes, you have some information, but can you make sense of it? No. You need metadata to be able to make sense um, of your data, and that's how um, information comes across. Now, hopefully this is an easy menti, not like the other one, um, and the voting is open. Why do you think it is essential to document data. And we're thinking throughout the research project. So while you're using data, once your project ended and you're sharing data, maybe you have to share it during the project with other collaborators. Why do you think it is essential to document data? Findability, evidence, reliability. Fantastic. These are the, these are the exact, exact answers that I was looking for. Um, evidence to reuse, reusability is, is, is getting uh, in the lead. Um, validity, integrity, understandable. Yes, 
documentation makes data understandable. Accountability. Yes, you are liking this poll. We're getting many responses. Thank you so much. I, I threw you off with a, with a rather complex one we had earlier. Um, this is fantastic because by understanding why data is essential, why documenting data is essential, then we are more likely to actually document data properly and ensure um, that data are fair. Thank you so much all for completing the poll. Um, and just to recap, why is it essential to document data, efficiency and accessibility, ethical and accurate data reuse, ensures reproducibility and validation. It actually helps with compliance and ethical standards as well, because we are thinking of the participant information sheets and the blank copies of consent form and so on, and it ensures long-term preservation. Now, at UK Data Service, when we think of documentation to make it easier to understand, we hope, we are dividing it into two levels, the data level documentation and the study level documentation. With the data level documentation, we're talking about the individual data objects. So variable labels, variable names, value labels, and so on. Study level documentation is the high level documentation. So user guides, questionnaires, code book. Let's have a look at data level documentation, variable names. What are the best practices? How do I actually name my variables? Question number system, that usually works very well. So for example, you have a questionnaire that has Q1A, Q1B, Q2, Q3, QC, and so on you can actually name your variables like that. It's much easier to track them in the questionnaire if you respect the name within the questionnaire that you've used. If you don't have names in the questionnaire, you can also use a numerical order system. So variable one, variable two, variable three. Also, you can use meaningful abbreviations. So a lot of the studies that we host do have government office region seen as the um, geographical variable. Instead of naming that variable location, which is a location variable, where do they reside, for example, we can just use the standard GOR. It stands for government office region. Most likely everyone will understand that. It is advisable for interoperability reasons between platforms with different software to have variable names that are no longer than eight characters and that do not have any spaces. We're going back to, to Unix. Variable labels, very similar, brief and concise, um, looking at a maximum of eight, 80 characters. Um, now software are much better, I would say, and even 120 characters are, are quite okay. Again, it depends on the platform and the software you're using. Ensure that you include a unit of measurement where appropriate. So we gave the example with question 11 B H E X W. Once we read the question, we have question 11 B hours spent taking physical exercise in a typical week. So hours spent exercise per week. We know from the label exactly what the what the question is asking and how it is reporting it as well. I've mentioned it before, using coding or classification schemas. Now again, we're very lucky to have the Office for National Statistics that they publish a number of classification and standards that you can use. So for example, the standard classification, um, occupation classification 2010 or NUTS, where we have, for example, ethnicity, religion, how we can actually use um, standardized um, classifications. The more we use, the better. It does actually allow for interoperability and harmonization. And we also have the government analyst function that does provide harmonization standards and guidance as well. So you might be wondering, well, my data only contains 10 or 15 variables because I'm doing a very experimental study. It only takes little time um, to familiarize yourself with the um, classification schemas. Um, they're openly available. Everyone can use them and they will increase the usability of the data. Uh, and again, 
going back to the data management plan, this is something we should be including in the data management plan when we're talking about how we're curating data and once we're sharing, how are we supporting interoperability and reusability by using standard occupational um, schemas. Value labels, again, very similarly, avoid blanks. Um, again, if we're going back 20 years ago, um, from what I've heard, um, most of the value labels were blank. Um, the, the landscape change researchers are fantastic in prov providing metadata. They're fantastic in making sure that they use a system that is easy to understand. So, for example, using 99.98 or minus 99.98 for not recorded, not provided, and so on. For value labels, again, we need to be brief with a maximum of 120 characters, excluding non-ASCII characters. Um, again, they become um, an issue if we want to convert the data and using the coding or classification schemes that we've talked before. Now, to put it in practice, um, I gave an example from a recent teaching data set we're making available at the service. Um, looking at the variable names, for example, DV621. What is your six? Very clear label, very clear variable label. It's a derived variable. It's explained in the documentation that it's a derived variable and it's asking what is your six? Or for example, the marital status, Mars star, a six, six marital status as the label, and then we have the value labels clearly described there. One married, two separated, three widowed, four single. And again, if you're unsure, for example, what is usually the standard way to name variables or to label variables, you can always look at existing data in documentation. Um, this is one of the reasons documentation is as well important because it actually helps other researchers make sure that their data is fair. Data label documentation for interview data because we keep focusing on numerical data. It can be embedded in the data file, and we do have a number of collections that in the header of each interview, we have information um, under file properties or some of them within the quality data analysis software, or it can be provided as a separate file. We can think of it as an index file, and we call it a data list. We do have a model, um, and it's, we have the, the link available, so please make use of that. Again, it's under Creative Commons, so reuse, um, reshare, adapt, however you would like. This is an example for um, interview data, data level documentation that was taken from pioneers of social research. Um, it is a bit different than standard um, data list because of course we can see we have names in there. We do have consent for that data to be shared. We are talking about pioneers of social research. It's an interesting collection. Um, if you do have some time, um, it, it is certainly a collection that's worth um, exploring. Study level documentation. So we're going the upper level. What do we need to know from the project study perspective? We need to know about the data collection methodology and processing. So this includes things like sampling, sampling procedure, information about the population, the fieldwork protocols that have been used or experimental protocols, interviewer instructions. We need to have a code book and a user guide, information sheet and consent forms. Again, the blank versions. Do not upload to repositories completed versions of consent form. It's just the blank versions to make sure that ethically that data can be shared. We're talking about questionnaire, show cards, topic guides for qual data, for transcripts, having that nice header, having a data list, and also including links to reports and publications. Um, ideally, DOIs are possible, but if DOIs are not possible, even the link, um, the regular URL can be provided. Now, a quick example of how study level documentation looks like. Um, the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey provides fantastic documentation. We can see they have a disclosure control report. 
um, a questionnaire and user notes. They've also provided a technical report. And at our end, UK Data Archive does provide a citation file, so it includes the proper citation. We can see, you know, all the slides that have pictures. I do have the full citation of the data. The UK Data Archive data dictionaries, they are created from the SPSS version and they're available in RTF format. They're simply for discoverability purposes. They just contain the variable in value metadata, absolutely no observation numbers or anything like that. And also a readme file as well that contains information about what checks have been done on the data, how to access the data and so on. Now, metadata during the research data life cycle, um, and this I think puts things really into perspective. That's why I've included it in here. Um, this is a technique usually used in journalism, the five W's and the one H. Who, what, when, where, why, and how. So during the project thinking, who created the data? What does the data file contain? When were the data created? Where were the data created? why were the data created and how were the data created now you can ask these questions you don't have to think in terms of oh but how does it match with the metadata schema if you are depositing via responsible repository because realistically a lot of um responsible repository use structure metadata schemas behind the scenes so as researchers, we don't actually see in the code book this specific field, this title like that or so on. No, we see the nice user interface. But there's a few metadata schemas that are used. For example, Dublin Core was the first metadata standards for web content. And a lot of responsible repositories, while they use a domain-specific metadata schema, so for example, the Data Documentation Initiative for Social Science Data, they also provide a version of Dublin Core. Um, it's a very high level metadata standard, very easy to use um, and very easy to implement as well. But of course, there's statistical data and metadata exchange as well, which is designed for statistical data and metadata. Or the data side metadata schema, which is used for publication and citation of digital data sets that have a persistent identifier. So at UK Data Service, we use the Data Documentation Initiative for discoverability. We have Dublin Core for additional discoverability via other systems and also the data site metadata schema because we do have a digital object identifier. When it comes to the Data Documentation Initiative, it, we are talking about rich and detailed metadata standards. And there are the DDI codebook, which is about the study so the higher level, how the data was collected, why the data was collected, and so on. But we also have the DDI lifecycle, which goes beyond that, and it's about the variable um, level in the question level metadata. From a researcher perspective, when we hear about metadata, we need to understand it's about providing this high level information, if we're talking about DDI codebook, so a metadata example, the annual population survey that we have in our catalog, we can see title, alternative title, study number, all of those are metadata schema fields. But they look very friendly, right? It's absolutely nothing to be scared of. Dates of field work, country, spatial unit, observation unit, observation unit, location, population, and so on. If during the project you keep a track of all of these, when you have to submit your, your data, it's much more straightforward. Also, responsible repositories ensure that they use control vocabularies and ontologies to make sure that the data and the data collections are, are fair. So country, for example, that is a control vocabulary very similar to spatial unit and observation unit. You actually have to select which is the one that applies. Um, and it's something that we've implemented to ensure that um, data fit the fair data principles. Quick question. I've been talking quite a lot, so it's time for you to have a thing that the, the voting is open. When should you document your data? We have one taking the lead at the beginning of the project, at the end of the project, through the life cycle of the project. Documenting data 
working in terms of absolutely everything. So the study level, the data level, making sure that we have this metadata. And again, it can be in a very friendly format in a, in a Word document. The one leading is the correct one. It is throughout the life cycle of the project. It just makes it much easier rather than at the beginning of the project, you will not know some information. At the end of the project, you might have forgotten some information. So treating again documentation as a life process, it ensures you have good quality documentation. Thank you all again for, for completing the poll. Now briefly about data security storage and backup as well. Data must be protected from unauthorized access, use, change, disclosure and destruction. How do we do that? We're talking about the strategy here. So controlling access to computers, passphrases, locking your machine, having antivirus, restricting access to sensitive materials, if you have personal data, making sure it's kept separate, having power search protection, most institutions have that, utilizing encryptions. And when we're saying utilizing encryption, it is on all devices. Um, desktop, laptops, mobile devices, USB um, flash drives, and so on, and also at all location. So if you have data on your machine, be it at work, be it at home, be it when you're uh, on a train, make sure that the device is encrypted. Of course, control the physical aspect as well. To building, sometimes it can be difficult and totally outside of our control, but not to rooms and filing cabinets. So when we keep the consent forms, ensuring that those are stored in a proper filing cabinet that is locked and only the people that should be allowed access to, to the consent forms are allowed access to that. And of course, very important to properly dispose of data and equipment and we're talking about data disposal, and we're giving examples of tools that you can use to ensure um, ethical and legal data disposal. Now, when it comes to digital backup strategy, it's essential to make sure that you do have a backup strategy in place. Now, luckily, if we do research as part of an organization, the organization will have a backup strategy. So always make sure to check with your institutional um organization because most likely they will have a strategy in place and they can provide information on where do they keep the files, making sure that one copy is actually stored off site. Um, and we usually advise for three plus copies. But again, at an institutional level, that is that is usually the standard. Why do we need a backup strategy? Because things can go wrong for a variety of reasons either accidental or maliciously. Most likely it's going to be accidental, not maliciously. Human error by accident, pressing control delete um, and not being able to do an undo um, in restoring all the data and documentation. Hardware failure sometimes, software or media falls, virus infectious uh, infection, this can be actually um, kept under control if you do have up-to-date antivirus and, and firewall protection or even power failure as well. Keeping you occupied with Mintis now, the voting is open. Which of the following is considered the most secure for backing up data? Is it creating regular backups on both internal and external source storage devices? using an online cloud storage service or storing data on a local hard drive you only have access to. We have one taking the lead, creating regular backups, both internal and external storage devices. Thank you all for completing the poll. The leading one is the correct answer. It is about having regular backups on both internal and external. You need to have that copy off-site. Worst case scenario, um, the, if the internal copies are being destroyed, you have the off-site copy. Apologies, I can feel a sneeze coming, but it's there and it's not working. Data display. Interestingly, this is something that can be very easily overlooked because we think, oh, we're pressing delete, it went to the recycle bin, I've deleted it, it's all fine. Or I, play, I press shift delete and it doesn't even go to the recycle bin and it's all fine. Actually, 
Not necessarily, even with formatting a hard drive doesn't securely erase all the information. This is why we advise for dedicated software to be used. Um, and there's quite a lot of software and freeware um, available out there for personal use or your institutional can provide it. BC wipe, wipe file, delete, don't click, eraser and secure eraser for Windows platform, or if you're using Mac and um, permanent eraser. If we're talking about physical data, um, ensure that you have a certified shredder and a certified policy in place to actually dispose of that data once it has been shredded. Now, we finished with the data curation and we're going into data sharing strategies. How can we ensure um, we share data? Now, again, the data landscape changed quite a lot um, at a fast pace. Um, and there are various ways of sharing research data, be it domain-specific repositories, so you have data service providers, for example, the UK data services are data service providers, you have archives, you have data centers that um, allow the deposit of data and dissemination of data, you have institutional repositories, more generalistic, but based at your institution. You could also self-preserve and disseminate. You have commercial data sharing platforms. And nowadays, you also have direct submission with journal publications. All data sharing methods have advantages and disadvantages. There are situations where, for example, yes, we would like to share via a, a, a domain-specific repository, but maybe we have in place a cost recovery model. So we do need to make sure that we self-preserve and disseminate. If you self-preserve and disseminate, you need to ensure that you have all the policies in place about storage, long-term preservation, short-term preservation, and so on. So it becomes much harder, but sometimes it's done because that's the only way forward. And for example, most of the data might be made available via self-preservation with some of the data being made available via a responsible repository. When you're considering data sharing practices, there are key considerations that you can keep in mind. What is the purpose of the data sharing? Is it going to actually fit fair? So is the data going to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, for example, by just uploading it onto a, a platform? Data sensitivity and confidentiality, do I need to bear in mind access level? And is the place where I make available the data providing the access levels that I need for my data? Ethical and legal implications, am I allowed to share the data via that specific platform? Very rarely we have seen protocols where the specific platform was actually included. So from an ethical perspective, you must ensure that the data is shared as promised to the participants. Does it ensure long-term preservation? Or am I uploading data somewhere where in a couple of weeks' time it might be gone? What are the security measures in place? And what are the costs and resources? Do I actually have to pay a fee? What do I have to prepare to be able to deposit the data? What's the technology and infrastructure that's needed or that's already available that could make my data fair? And also in terms of stakeholder engagement and support. If, for example, I self-disseminate the data, I am going to have to provide one-to-one -one stakeholder support so all the secondary researchers will come to me. If I make the data available via a responsible repository, of course, we go back to data sensitivity, confidentiality, and the, the access levels. But it might be that most of the secondary researchers can get support from the repository where the data is shared. And to me, there are only the, the severe um, cases escalated. For example, uh, the documentation might mention these derived variables will be made available. When will they be made available? And they contact me to find out more. Now, responsible repository, do I give you technology? Because they are data service providers that host facilities that there to establish some standards and best practices. Similar to FAIR, the Research Data Alliance came up with the trust principles that are applicable to repositories, and it's all about transparency, responsibility, user focus, sustainability, and technology. Repositories can actually obtain different accreditation or certifications, so you can be a 
digital economy act accredited processor you can be an iso compliant environment you can be a core trust seal and um, certified repository why these repositories are easier to use from a data manager's perspective or data research perspective because they do have deposit license agreements in place that protect your rights and the repository's rights that ensure data users are aware of their rights and responsibilities, the secondary researchers, because we might not be able to share the data under a creative commons. We need to have safeguards in place. Well, these repositories are going to make sure that secondary researchers know what they need to do. And they also facilitate ethical and legal data sharing because the protocols used are actually checked so you can ensure that you are sharing what you should be sharing, that legislation is not contravened by using specific terminology. Um, and of course, by doing all of this, actually, it's not even just the ethical and legal, it is enhancing the value to the research community. Now, a question that keeps coming up is the data. What can I do? How, how can I share the data if it is um, licensed under a bespoke license? First advice, Always check the license and if in doubt, contact the data service provider from which you obtain the data. If you're unsure, say for example, you downloaded some data that's under a CC BY license, you've created some derived variables. It's just a CC BY, you can actually adapt, modify and reshare. So you can deposit that data in a repository. You have to make sure you acknowledge the original source but you can do that. Sometimes, however, you might access data that's not available under a license that permits resharing. That's when we share code. And we have provided a couple of considerations when sharing code, making sure that your code files are clean and they're well formatted and they do not contain any data. Containing data might be a breach, including um, avoid including unnecessary personal information. And by this, I'm referring to a lot of editors, for example, including their names or the names of people that they talked with about specific changes. Avoid um, that or do have a chat with the people that are involved, whether they would like that information to be made available or not, and make sure you document that. Make sure that they're well commented and always include the full citation. As we've seen it on the slides, always a full citation of the data that you've used. Provide in-depth structured metadata describing the files and the methods used to create the data. And also have a short readme files or methods documents that is, explains what you have done with the data and what the code um, can be used to do. If you don't know where to deposit, um, our three, three, three data is the best place to go. It's a registry of research data repositories. Um, you can search based on the discipline, you can search based on the certification a repository might have, the location of a repository is the best um, source for finding out where you can share your data. Of course, if you're uncertain, you can always get in touch with us as well. Um, we are a domain specific repository, so we have a specific remit that we follow, but we can always advise on alternative routes for deposit as well. Now, we do have a couple of minutes for questions as well. Um, that was the, the final session. We have 10 minutes. But before that, after this presentation, I know I have provided a lot of information. The slides will be made available, so please don't panic. Um, I always feel like I'm bombarding with information. But do you feel more confident in managing and sharing your data? It's fantastic to see the yeses. Um, this is um, it's such a great feeling. Um, I'm, I am most grateful. Um, and I, the key message to, to take home, it's always if unsure, get in touch. We can't stress enough how important to get in touch either with your institution, get in touch with the UK Data Service. If you're working with social science data, never hesitate to get in touch. Get in touch with your funder as well. If you have um, things that you need to clarify, it's always best to have as much accurate information as possible. Um, 
That's fantastic and, and, and amazing um, feedback. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, the slides will be made available. So everything you can, you can reuse there under a Creative Commons license. We do have best practices guidance available online. We provide a number of training events. We do have all the tools in the templates as well as tutorials that we've discussed during the workshop. Um, so please do make sure you visit the links. Um, and do make sure you get in touch with any questions. You can have a look at our um, partners as well. We were very closely with CESA, so do have a look at their data management expert guide, the closer training hub, if, especially if you're working with longitudinal data or the guide to social science preparation and archiving from our sister archive, ICPSR in the States. Thank you all so much um, and don't hesitate to get in touch uh, data sharing at ukdataservice.ac.uk or using our online forums. If there's anything we can help in terms of data management, assessing remit of sharing data and so on, um, there's absolutely nothing you, you can't get in touch with us about. We're, we're here to help as much as we can. Thank you all.